Well, that's very funny stories. You're, you're, you're turning up some of the secrets of, of Steve Blank's worst, the worst choices in life. Um, so when Steve Jobs uh, started next, I, I met him at Apple um, uh, when I was trying to sell him some stuff. And I'm, um, is a longer story. You have uh, two questions no one has ever asked. So far, so far, you're batting a hundred of asking questions no one's ever done. The story is when they, when they landed back, back in the Pacific Ocean, um, and got helicoptered to to both the United States, uh, they had to fill out uh, a customs form of where they've been, you know, and what they're bringing back. And so, where'd you travel to? Moon, you know, what are you bringing back? Rocks. And then they had to fill out an expense form. You know, where you would get paid for mile. They wanted to get paid per mile. And, and the government said, no, we'll pay you by day. <laughs> Hi, Steve. Thank you so much for joining me today. It is great to have you on the podcast. I'm looking forward to our conversation and digging into your experience. Um, me too. I, I can't wait to, to start the chat. There's so much aspiring entrepreneurs can learn from your work and experience in this space. But before we go into deep down uh, your experience, your talks and writings often incorporate great humor as an entrepreneur focused on data and learning. It's interesting you have this funny and creative sides. Do you have any favorite stand-up comedians or do you all write your uh, jokes uh, in your talks? I, I write my own jo jokes and you're the first one to ever, ever acknowledge that I do have a sense of humor. I mostly scare the heck out of my students, so I don't think they're laughing most of the time. But I think, you know, this goes back to being an entrepreneur. You need a positive attitude of all the crazy things that happen to you. You know, the, you, one day you're you're on the top of the world, you just raised a lot of money, and the next day your co-founder quit, or your biggest customer decided they changed their mind, or, or something terrible happened. And, and if you don't have this ability to bounce back, this tenacity, um, you know, you'll get depressed and you'll stay in bed all day. Um, so you really need a positive outlook on, on life and the circumstances around you or else you'll take yourself and everything else too seriously. You know, the in Rome, where they used to have the uh, someone stand behind the emperor, you know, just reminding him that, uh, you know, all men are mortal and, and this too shall pass you know, as he was parading through the streets. Um, so that's what I suggest to entrepreneurs is, you know, keep a positive attitude or because things will be great one day and they'll be bad another and uh, and you will just keep moving forward. So that's the answer to why I, I have a sense of humor is to get you through. It's what got me through 20 years of being an entrepreneur in, in eight startups. Van pioneering a completely new idea, lean startup and customer discovery methodology that challenges conventional wisdom. How do, do you maintain conviction when few believe your approach and many argue against it? In those lonely situations where you lack validation, how do you determine whether to proceed ahead alone or accept that uh, an idea may be fatally flawed? You, you know, um, there's a phrase that, uh, I don't know where I heard it, but I think it's a pretty good one that describes the nature of a founder, whether it was creating a new concept by Glean or creating a startup, is profound beliefs loosely held, which means you're passionate about your ideas, but you're open to input and feedback uh, to allow you to pivot or change or 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 make the idea better. Um, you know, that's the nature of a startup. You have a series of hypotheses on day one and and you're focused on a direction. But as you get input, you might change or pivot or, or even restart. The same was true when we created the Lean Startup Method and we created them in the U.S., the National Science Foundation Innovation Corps or a program called Hacking for Defense or at Stanford, the Gordian Knott Center for National Security Innovation. Each one of those were either my idea or a set of us who had an idea that no one else shared at the time, but we had profound beliefs that we had some insight that would take it forward and uh, what you're looking for is evidence the evidence in the in the case of a startup is you know can you attract people can you attract money and more importantly can you attract early customers when all you have are a set of slides or an M 
you know, a wireframe or, or something else for a lean startup is, was, did anybody else see what I saw? You know, in that case, it was Eric Reese who became the first practitioner who said, well, yes, and then this solves a lot of problems. And then, you know, like it was, a, it was a 10 year overnight success. It took about 10 years before the rest of Silicon Valley went, well, this is a lot better than writing business plans. We can actually have a methodology to do this. So I'll go back to this concept of profound beliefs loosely held, which just means, you know, passion and vision, but open to input as you, um, as you get additional evidence. Does that, does that make sense? How did you see the pattern? I mean, are there any uh, solution for the pattern? Yeah. So, you know, I've, uh, this is even before AI became a thing. I always used to describe, uh, you know, one skill set of an entrepreneur among others is a neural net running in your background, uh, which required ingestion of lots of data. So if you're just, you know, focused on a single point, you'll sometimes miss some patterns that come about from, from looking at multiple areas. Um, and so, you know, that's one of the traits of a great entrepreneurs, you're curious about a lot of things, a lot of things that might at the time see completely, you know, disaggregated or not related. But again, if this neural net and pattern recognizer is, is running in the background, one day those things will come to you and say, well, wait a minute, this kind of looks like this. And maybe there's some, some opportunity here. For me personally, I realized pattern recognition was actually a, a, a skill I had, though I couldn't articulate what it was. And, and it, but it required ingestion of a lot of data from a, from a lot of stuff. And, and as I said, being curious about more than just, you know, whether it was semiconductors or supercomputers or biotech, those things tended to sometimes uh, come together in an interesting way. You had opportunities earlier in your career to meet uh, with influential founders like Steve Jobs. Also, you know, the co-founders of Tesla, J.B. Stroll, Scott uh, Andrews in early 2000s. Can you discuss why you choose not to work with Steve Jobs or Tesla's first co-founders, J.B. Strobel and Scott Andrews? Well, that's very funny stories. You're, you're, you're turning up some of the secrets of, of Steve Blank's worst, the worst choices in life. Um, so when Steve Jobs... Uh, started next I, I met him at apple um uh, when i was trying to sell him some stuff and i'm um there's a longer story of met some of the engineers when they were designing the mac and they actually designed one of the chips i was manager of in, in one of my chip companies but um but uh, steve used to take people out for interviews in long walks and back then next was in a, a town called redwood city near the near the bay and we went for a walk and about oh i don't know five minutes into the walk we both decided simultaneously that this would be a bad idea for me <laughs> working for him. I decided that as a marketeer, that wouldn't be my job. My job would be do, to do whatever marketing Steve Jobs wanted to do. And Steve Jobs realized immediately that I wouldn't be doing what he wanted to do. And there could only be one marketeer in the company. So he said, what do you say we turn around and walk back? <laughs> And when I came back, my friend who, had, uh, who was the VP of engineering at the time, John Rubenstein, said, that's the shortest interview I've ever seen Steve have. <laughs> and I said, well, for good reason. So, so the answer was I didn't turn down working for Steve Jobs. He, he, he quickly decided probably a nanosecond before I did that this would be a bad idea. The, the Tesla story is actually more fun. After my eighth startup, I met uh, somebody who was running uh, I think it was Nissan's uh, um, Automotive Research Center in Silicon Valley, Scott Andrews, who had this idea about electric cars way before most people had actually been thinking about it. And, and he had sketched out on a napkin for me the difference between a hybrid or a pure electric vehicle. And, and pretty quickly, we decided that maybe we should do a car startup uh, as my ninth startup. And so we, we were sitting in an office I had uh, down the street from my house, and we found a a recent graduate of Stanford, a, a kid who was driving a Porsche, but attached to the Porsche was a battery pack and a trailer. And so he had electrified his uh, Porsche 944 driving around Palo Alto. And the kid's name was J.B. Straubel. And J.B., of course, went on to be the CTO and co-founder of, um, uh, of Tesla. And uh, J.B. and I and Scott must have worked, I don't know, three, four months on this 
electric vehicle startup until I realized a couple of things. One was, it was probably, and, and again, this was my brilliant observation, it might take 10 years and $50 million to do this company. I was off by about two decades and about, oh, 100x in the amount of capital we would need. But most importantly for me, I realized that I no longer had the passion um, and interest to, to commit to a startup at the level that was necessary. In the United States, there's something called a red-eye flight, which means you would fly at nighttime overnight from one coast of, Cal uh, of the United States, from California to New York and vice versa, to make a meeting in the morning. Um, and I would do that often when I was a passionate entrepreneur. I'd call somebody in the afternoon and from California, set up an 8 a.m. meeting, take a red eye, and literally come back for, to California that same day because it was an important meeting. I realized um, after my eighth startup, I had become maybe too successful and too old to want to do that. And I was going to be competing with other entrepreneurs who would do that. And if you couldn't do that, if you couldn't stay in the game, it was time to retire and go home. And and I told that to JB and, and Scott, and they were disappointed. Though JB went on to find a much more competent CEO and, and certainly a much more successful career than if he would have hung out with me. But I think the lesson there for me, which I've now used as a test, is would you do the same things that you would have done you, you know, when you were like eager and passionate? And if the answer is no, you're going to be competing with the people who will. Uh, and you ought to decide whether you still want to be in the game or not. So that's a very long story of, of two questions no one has ever asked. Me. So, far, so far, you're batting 100 of asking questions no one's ever done. Many influential founders are college dropouts. So if you could overhaul the entire education system, how would you redesign it, optimally equip students for professional and entrepreneurial success in the real world? Well... First of all, I'd encourage them to stay in college. Um, you know, um, dropping out, dropping out, and being successful is kind of like, you know, the survivors tend to tell the tale. It, it doesn't describe the career <laughs> career path of others who have dropped out and haven't been successful. So, while it makes great stories, I'm not sure it's the optimum path. Um, that said, you know, for those who who stay in school. Um, and are interested in being an entrepreneur, and most most do what I'm about to suggest, getting both a theoretical uh, background, and whether it's computer science or, or mechanical engineering or biotech, but also getting some hands-on experience inside of a uh, university of actually building things, and, um, and not only things, but actually building teams. That is, try, try, you know, a startup is not an individual activity. It's a team effort is trying to figure out who are the types of people you would like to work with or for, you know, what, what's the culture that kind of, you know, is it you all work at the same pace and whatever, um, you know, do you want to work with complementary skills or everybody has to be the same? And what's it like actually to experience failure uh, even when you're in college uh, because everything doesn't unfold like the press stories about great successes. Most startups fail, and the successful entrepreneurs are, are the ones who know how to deal with failure and adversity and actually get up and do it again and again. Learning that while you're still in school is probably some of the best experience you could get. But, but I wouldn't just overemphasize the technology part. I would emphasize the other part, the team building part, the hands-on part, the talking, the learning how to talk to customers part, etc. Does that make sense? Yes. You also resemble the entrepreneurs as artists. And uh, teaching uh, entrepreneurship is also uh, uh, should be in the early years of education. Uh, should you explain it? Yeah, you know, it's one of the one of the things I observed early on when I stopped actually doing being an entrepreneur and then started teaching entrepreneurship was a couple of my friends, you know, who knew me as an entrepreneur would laugh. They said, "Steve, you can't teach entrepreneurship," you know. Like, you got to be born an entrepreneur. And I was kind of confused because I was teaching entrepreneurship, but I didn't really have, they were right. I really didn't have a theory about why was it that I thought you could teach, you know, this endeavor to others. And so I started looking at what were some parallels to, to what I really believed was an art and a craft rather than, that is, being a founder 
and what we're talking about being a founder or part of a founding team is not like being an, it is not like being an accountant, right? It's, you know, where there's a set of rules and day-to-day things, you know what to do, etc. Entrepreneurship and founders are closer to artists, as you said. And what I meant by that, you know, artists see things that other people don't. Musicians hear things and composers hear things that, you know, other people don't. You know, authors can envision a novel and, you know, it's basically for all of them, the art of creation of that art is simply getting out that passion and writing it down and and and, and putting it in place. Or a painter is exactly that. In fact, the, the best story is um, when someone went to Michelangelo's studio in the 1500s and they saw a 12 foot block of marble and they said, what's that? And Michelangelo was reported to say, well, that's the most beautiful statue of a sculpture in the world. And they said, it's a 12 foot block of marble. And he said, come back in three years. And they came back in three years and that, that 12 foot block of marble had been transformed into something called the Pieta, which if you've seen it in, in Rome is the most you know beautiful sculpture in the world. And they said, how did you do that? And he said, I just removed the stone around it. Well, that's what founders do. They remove the stone around their vision, removing all these obstacles they see at a time. And so if you think about how do artists get trained, I started thinking about what did we learn how to train artists? Well, starting in the Renaissance, we realized that the best way to train artists was, first of all, apprenticeship. That is, you would sit at the feet of a master and they, you would start to do things, right? Yes, you would learn some theory, but you would actually get hands-on in practice. But in the 19th century, we also learned that in addition to apprenticeship, we could teach art to the earliest possible ages to children in kindergarten or, or, you know, when they were five or six, they would teach, you know, finger painting and then they would teach storytelling and then they would teach, you know, how to make sculptures out of clay and, and whatever, such that we didn't expect all those young students to actually become artists. Some of them would realize, oh my gosh, I have a passion for this. This could be a career. But the others would appreciate how hard it was to actually make something of value. That analogy, I think, applies to entrepreneurship. Number one is we should be teaching children at the earliest age that it's possible to create something of value in business. That, you know, whether it's a a candy stand, a lemonade stand, you know, selling something, or a small business, et cetera. Um, but even if they don't succeed, they will appreciate how difficult it is to, to do that. And we should be creating classes that both have um, early stage entrepreneurial education as well as apprenticeships. Um, does that make sense? It's a long story about entrepreneurship and, and training founders or like training artists. How about companies? The Apollo Moon landing exam fight the cultural clash between the Horizon 3 innovation and Horizon 1 bureaucracy. And the, as an exp- expert on corporate innovation, what lessons should large companies draw from this history to avoid stifling their disruptive projects and effectively integrate them into established systems. There is a great story, I think, at the Apollo moon landing uh, example. Yeah, so, you know, the Apollo moon landing was certainly a disruptive set of activities. And the story is when they when they landed back, back in the Pacific Ocean um, and got helicoptered to, to both the United States uh, they had to fill out uh, a customs form of where they've been, you know, and what they're bringing back. And so, where'd you travel to? Moon. You know, what are you bringing back? Rocks. And then they had to fill out an expense form, you know, where you would get paid for mile. They wanted to get paid per mile. And, and the government said, no, we'll pay you by day. So because they thought if they got paid for a mile, they went a quarter of a million miles one way and back, you know, a half a million miles in total. They would have been very rich. But instead, they got ten dollars a day for expenses because they were in the military. Um, but but back to your question, what's really interesting is companies are just, you know, organizational constructs to focus on repeatable process. 
So at, at, in the beginning, every large company was a startup searching for a business model. That is the distinction between a startup and a large company is the large companies get large by executing known business models. It's a fancy term for a business model is who are my customers, what, what pricing, what's the right distribution channel, what's the right supply chain, et cetera. But startups aren't executing business models, they're searching for them. And this distinction between search and execution had never been articulated before we, we started talking about the lean startup. But if you think about startups, large companies executing business models, they innovate, but they tend to innovate around their core businesses, around core products and services. It's not that large companies are, are innovative, but the innovation tends to go, maybe I'll make the product in a new color, or maybe I'll change the price or have a more effective supply chain. And, and good companies do this all the time. Uh, better companies actually figure out that maybe I could take the same products or services and maybe sell it to a different channel or a different customer set. Or maybe even more sophisticated, I could use my manufacturing capacity to build something else. But I have these great factories. I could maybe uh, build, you know, additional uh, things out of that same factory. But that's not disruption. Disruption is actually thinking about new categories that never existed before, or new combinations of products. Um, and that's really hard inside of existing functional units like engineering or sales or marketing or worse, inside of product line divisions that have profit and loss based on existing products. And smart companies have figured out that, and this started with Clayton Christensen when he wrote not only The Innovator's Dilemma, The Innovator's Solution, is, is that you really need to keep disruptive organizations at first outside of the mainstream of the organization. Because those people operate not only with different ideas, but different culture, different speed, um, and more importantly, different approaches to risk. You need the, those risks you take to be essentially say, uh, fail safe, meaning you don't want to destroy your core business with an experiment. But in the disruptive organization, you want the experiments and the culture to be safe to fail. That is, you want to be able to say, well, that didn't work and we didn't damage a business. And the best example of this is SpaceX. SpaceX today is launching rockets on an operational cadence from three launch pads about every three, three and a half days. Um, over 100 rockets a year will go up this year. And so that is operational excellence. They do not run experiments, at least on a big scale, on, on, on those rockets. That Falcon 9, there is a crew that knows how to wheel it out, plug it in, launch it, check it out, etc. But there's another group in Texas that's building something incredibly disruptive at SpaceX called Starship. And Starship has ex basically exploded three times, each time getting better and further into space. And each time they're learning massive things. That is not an operational cadence. That is, in fact, a disruptive organization learning by experimentation rapidly, about 10x more rapid than a traditional NASA program to make a moon rocket. Well, what's really interesting is those are not disconnected programs. The Falcon 9 people are teaching the, star, the Starship people, hey, we wish we'd have, we would have put the access panel over here. And the Starship people are teaching them, the Falcon 9 people, you know those engine chamber pressures? You could probably crank them up another 2% and you'd get another couple hundred pounds or a thousand pounds of payload without really screwing up the rocket. So they do interact. And most important lesson for corporations, that disruptive thing going on in Texas, that Starship, that's eventually going to be the company's core product. Right now, it's on the edge. Innovation always occurs on the edge for disruptive innovation. And when it succeeds, it moves into the core and eventually replaces and becomes the next generation product line. CEOs who can manage sustaining and disruptive innovation simultaneously um, it's a real art, and most companies kind of either fail to do that and their product life cycle and company life cycle, you know, goes like this, or they kind of do acquisitions of, well, we're not creative enough to do it inside, so why don't we buy a division or an innovative and disruptive company? Not a bad idea, but that integration of the two is really difficult, or we could acquire people or intellectual property, etc. So the answer, your very long answer to 
But to a short question is, companies have a kind of a life cycle. You know, when you're in the middle of one, you think corporations last forever. Most corporations, at least nowadays, maybe last 15 to 20 years. The outliers maybe last 50. They fail because they fail to do this continual cycle of reinvention. I forgot what your question was. I think Netflix has a similar story. They, uh, yeah. While they were delivering the CDs, yeah. uh, they separate the uh, um, other division from the delivery. A decade after publishing the startup's owner's manual, um, what foundational startup concepts remain timeless versus needing an update, uh, given the evolution of lean methodologies, emerging new technologies, AI, and entrepreneur uh, real realities uh, currently? You, you know, I think some of the, the biggest ones are the ones, let me start with, I thought this was going to be a fad, meaning, you know, lean would be, you know, one of the 55 things that, you know, come and go, and with, there was Six Sigma, and there was, you know, what, whatever it was. But it turns out a couple of the ideas are foundational. Um, you know, number one, as I, I mentioned, one of them, this distinction between what companies do and what startups do. Companies, you know, execute known business models, startups search for them. And that's actually an insight that says, well, why do we have different tools for early stage ventures? It's a big idea. We had no tools in the 20th century for, for startups. We basically had big company tools, you know, how to write a plan, five-year forecast, et cetera. But we didn't have this idea of customer discovery, validation, you know, agile engineering, et cetera. So, so out of that is the first derivative of what are some of the foundational things that have lasted. One is the fact that there's no facts inside the building, so get the heck outside. This notion of customer discovery. That is all you have. So the key, another foundational idea. All you have on day one as a founder is a set of untested hypotheses, which is a fancy word for saying most of the things you think, you're wrong. You're just guessing. It's a big idea. It's okay. That's what a founder's vision is about. The, the vision is really a, a cover word for, I'm guessing, about a lot of these things that I have a profound belief loosely held before I test it. And that's maybe the, another key idea, is get, get out of the building and do what? Well, not only talk to customers, but use those customer conversations to validate or invalidate or modify your hypotheses. And what's a good way to do that? Well, um, effective way, another key idea is let's build what we call minimum viable products, which are not actually the products, but whatever gets us the most learning at any point in time. Um, so we could build wireframes or prototypes or cardboard mockups or whatever. And the sum of this actually, and, and by the way, the other key idea was that agile engineering, you know, which became popular again at the turn of the century, um, allows us to run these experiments fairly rapidly. And what we're doing is actually collecting evidence. And we're collecting evidence that our hypotheses are guesses about what we call the business model. We're actually right. So, so all these things, uh, oh, and the last one is, and this one was actually key if you grew up in the 20th century. If you were wrong about some of your assumptions, eventually your investors would fire you. Well, today that's kind of laughable. I mean, eventually they might fire you, but we now have this idea that says, no, when you're wrong, you simply say, well, I guess my hypothesis was wrong. When I change, I do something called the pivot. And so the pivot allows you to actually run experiments, say that didn't work. I'm going to try something else based on that evidence without firing the founders. You're actually firing the plan rather than the founder. Eventually, as I said, the founder often gets fired, but but you get multiple shots at the goal now. So those key concepts, think about it, customer discovery, validation, MVPs, pivots, et cetera, are all, in, in hindsight, pretty, you know, pretty foundational to how innovation entrepreneurship works in an early stage venture or inside a large company when you're trying to do disruptive innovation. That said, if I could exhale, AI is going to change a lot of this stuff. Even today, in fact, the beginning of this year, like last year, I could already see that you could plug in AI to kind of do most of these things without human beings involved. Um, so the ideas are still foundational. It's questionable whether human beings will still be involved and what will happen when people are able to harness AI while other people are still doing it manually. I think 
the, the people using AI tools will have an unfair advantage um, because they'll be able to operate 100 or 1,000x faster um, uh, than those doing it manually. Are there any certain contexts or industries where uh, lean startup methodology or customer discovery may not be applied? Or what limitations do you have observed in effectively implementing lean startup principles? You know, when I when I first wrote the first book, The Four Steps of the Epiphany, I, I explicitly said this works for, for everything but life sciences. That is therapeutics or medical devices or diagnostics or digital health. <laughs> and then I got a call from a leading life science university, UCSF, and the United States, who said, we'd like you to teach this for life science. So I said, didn't you read my book? And they said, well, we did, but we think you're wrong. Um, well, I thought there's no way you could actually, you know, get out of the building and test a drug. But it turns out the drug is the least problem uh, of building a life science business. Uh, there's all kinds of other things you need to test. Uh, regulation, reimbursement, that is who will pay you, you know, um, you know, how will your product or, uh, or drug get distributed? What kind of partnerships will you have? So it turns out the invention, the, the technology, while it's a key component, is only a small piece of the rest of the business model. And while you weren't going to accelerate drug design, you could accelerate all the learnings about even if you had this drug, would this be a profitable business given the amount of money it was going to take you to do that? So. So the answer is I've yet to find, even in when I thought in the one area that, that it wouldn't help, it, it turns out in almost every business, the, the mistake is thinking that the technology is 100% of the risk. Um, it turns out almost in every case, the rest of the business model is the rest of the risk. Can I find enough customers? Can I get enough funding? You know, can we find the right channel? Will we're, we're regulation or incumbents, that is, competitors, kill this? Um, all those things, the lean method actually helps you discover early and might even help you decide that this business will never be profitable and it probably isn't a good one to do. Does that answer your question? Yes. Also, new markets and current markets. So is it possible to implement in the new markets discoveries? Yeah, so that was one of the things that got me really kind of hung up when I first started thinking about the lean model. It works pretty well when you're entering an existing market. You could go outside and ask customers, do you, what do you think of this new thing? You know, we're, we're in this market and people would go, oh, yeah, we'd like it cheaper or better or faster. Or, or does your thing, you know, does it come in blue? And, and they would know what you're talking about. And, and you could get some pretty accurate feedback about Maybe this is something that people might want or buy or or even better, they'll grab it out of your hands and say, can I take it home now? But what happens when you're doing something completely disruptive that's never existed before? As, as Steve Jobs used to say, is if I asked people what they, you know, if Henry Ford used to ask if people what they want, they would have said a horse with six legs. It turns out that, you know, the answer is not don't talk to people you, and just come up with an idea. The answer is customer discovery needs to take on a different form. You need to understand the day in the life of a customer. So let's go back to Henry Ford, who was the first mass market automob automobile manufacturer. Instead of asking people, do, do they want a car? He would have asked is like, you know, how far do you travel? You know, what would life be if you could travel 10 times further in half the time? All of a sudden, if he would have understood the day in the life of a potential customer before a car and what the life would have been after the car, you actually could have done customer discovery for a new market without having people tell you, I want a horse with six legs. They would have described the problem. And so in a new market, you truly need to get out, out and understand not about product features because no one will know what you're talking about. Uh, but about the, their day in the life, about the problem that they have today, whether they know they have a problem or not. Does that make sense? So the customer discovery questions you ask are very different, but still valid. And what was really interesting, the other part about discovery is different, is learning that the sales cycle is different. If you're in an existing market and I'm on your board of directors, I want to see a sales curve that looks like this. That is, if you're right, you're taking market share from incumbents because you have a better something. Well, the, the problem is, is most startups and investors assume for all startups, that's what the sales curve would look like. 
<coughs> but for disruptive products, the sales curve is actually the historic hockey stick with maybe a little blip from crazy people will buy one of your product to try it out. But adoption in the mainstream doesn't really happen to years later. Um, and it's this hockey stick that if you don't have investors who understand that you're going to have a number of years of, of living in the desert before adoption happens, you make the mistake of hiring sales, marketing, exactly like you are in an existing market and end up spending all your marketing and sales dollars here when you should have been saving it for the adoption curve. Make sense? Yes. Back to AI question. So uh, as as AI automates parts of the lean startup method is like MVP creation, rapid testing, how can founders retain the human-centered creativity and customer focus so core to your philosophy? And will AI, back to the question, amplify the benefits of iteratively learning from customers or potentially undermine them? Absolutely. I think it's going to be a really interesting world. And the question is, where does the human being get inserted in that uh, iteration loop? Um, you know, the question is, is it going to be a force multiplier? I mean, I'm old enough to remember when there was no Photoshop or any paint programs or even page layout programs. And when, when those first came out, everybody decided they could fire their graphics artists and they could be their own graphics artists. And people were able to make the world's worst art or the world's worst newsletters and layouts or web pages, that realizing that while you had the tool, it didn't make you the creative person. So there is one model that says AI is an adjunct, um, but it really still needs to be in the hands of a creative founder. That is one model of belief. There's another model that says, well, that might be true for some corner cases, but AI will become good enough to actually auto-generate new products and take if there's sufficient data. So for example, you know, the first place I would go with AI for uh, um, startups is where can I get the, the most detailed data set? So for example, for e-commerce, I could find out everything about you or prospective customers down to your name, the number of kids you have, where they go to school, et cetera, right? You could buy that data. Well, you could imagine an AI pipeline that just simply runs A-B tests, creates its own websites, you know, even populates it with products, et cetera. What happens in markets where I have insufficient data? Well, that's, in fact, maybe where the entrepreneur is now getting involved and hands-on. But you could imagine uh, uh, vertical markets like healthcare, where if I'm in the UK, the National Health Service and other countries have incredible data about individuals' health outcomes. You can imagine a AI pipeline creating, you know, services for healthcare based on data that faster and better than human beings. So the question is, will will become a force multiplier for the craftspeople that are there, or will it automate the pipeline completely? I think the jury's out, but I'm um, I'm excited to see what happens. And, and for all the entrepreneurs out there, I'd be experimenting like heck. Someone is going to build a uh, a piece of enterprise software that has this pipeline that allows entrepreneurs to plug in their data sets and that rapidly automates the entrepreneurial process. If I was an entrepreneur, you know, my last company was enterprise software for for doing the, the 20th century version of this. That's what I would be building today would be that end to end um, platform for for entrepreneurs. This industry has gone largely undisrupted for long, probably from since they have been uh, set up. What are the biggest opportunities for the venture capital funds to finance, uh, embrace the lean startup thinking uh, from refining uh, their investment thesis through rapid testing and anticipating the trends via customer discovery? Well, you know, VC is a hit space business, right? It's, um... You know, it's also a giant Ponzi scheme, meaning where it's kind of like musical chairs. But, you know, VCs are already starting to use analytical tools to to make some bets. Again, it's been a craft business where the artistry of both deal flow, finding the right bets, picking the right companies, doubling and tripling down, working with the entrepreneurs. That's a that's been a craft uh, and probably a good chunk of it will still remain a craft because. For now, it's still a people-to-people -people business, but 
picking some of those are, are I think, going to be automated as well. Um, you know, the bad news for founders, you don't realize that, again, you, you know, while you see one VC, they have a portfolio of companies. They barely remember your name until you found product market fit and then they start paying attention. But also it's it's a game. I mean, while your interest might be building a product that changes the world, that's not their business model. It's a big idea. Well, they might like you personally, and and some of them actually do like their founders. They don't really care at the end of the day. Their business model is to get the greatest return out of a portfolio of companies. Um, and so they're making financial decisions while you you might be making, here's you know how I want to change the world decisions. And early on, your interests are aligned, but often your interests become unaligned where the VC wants to optimize the outcome and you want to you know, be around for the next 20 years. Um, so that's something else I remind your remind founders is that um, your interest and your investor's interest are sometimes not the same. If your only goal is to, you know, change the world, not understanding their only goal is to optimize their return on, on the investment in your company. So is it the dark side? Are there any dark side? Having been in Silicon Valley for many years, you have seen the behind the curtain of tech industry hype and also startup work. In your opinion, what is the untold uh, part of the Silicon Valley, as you mentioned about the VC industry, uh, rarely get discussed openly? Well, you know, one of the, one of the things that um, the business press does terribly badly is they talk all about the CEO. Um, you know, for most companies, at least those who don't have dual use stock, the CEO is just works for the board. They could be hired and fired, you know, in one board meeting. But you never hear about what goes on in the board. You don't even know then. How, how many people could name the CEO of Facebook? Okay. How many people could name the board members of Facebook? Okay. How many people could name the CEO of Alphabet or Microsoft or OpenAI? How many people could name the board members of those companies? It's crickets. And so the, the, the secret is not understanding that, you know, boards actually have immense power. Though in the last couple of decades, they've, uh, at least for the most successful companies, they've abdicated their adult supervision role in exchange for not being thrown off the board and, and not being able to invest in the next round. Um, so the dirty secret is that um, for a good number of unicorns, the board, there is no adult supervision or fiduciary responsibility from anybody. Um, and that's not been healthy. It's been good for financial returns. I don't think it's been healthy for the culture of startups. I think they've become a lot more toxic. So, for example, so you know, social media, you know, for me, I remind my students joining Facebook, once we understood it's, it's uh, and other social media companies, you know, it's like joining Purdue Pharma once you understood the, the bad effects of Oxycontin and like how it was destroying people as a drug. You know, social media has become a destructive drug, yet, yet, yet there really isn't. A, people don't trash the company or the board in the way they should. Um, it's not a healthy thing for society. And, and more importantly, a good, or, or there was a startup out of Stanford called Juul that made um, vaping, you know, popular for teenagers. Um, and people celebrated its financial success while it was destroying the health and addicting you know, millions and tens of millions of students. The people at Tiger Global should have been on the Interpol's 10 most wanted list. But in fact, because it was a great return to the investors, um, you know, the, the Silicon Valley investors have kind of, and other investors have kind of lost any moral center, center of what they'll invest in. And I don't think that's been healthy in the 21st century. Startup accelerators has, have been very popular beyond Seed funding, what core values do you structure programs provide founders today? And are they still as relevant given how much startup knowledge is now freely available online? I think that's a great point. I mean, when I was an entrepreneur, you know, the amount of knowledge you could gather was limited by your coffee bandwidth, meaning could you have coffee and, and to your proximity physically to Silicon Valley and more importantly, Sandhill Road. Would anybody have coffee with you that had some pattern recognition about, you know, how do you build a startup, et cetera. 
where in fact, most people like I did were inventing it by yourself with maybe a couple of comments from others. Your point about entrepreneurship is everywhere and entrepreneurship is available, uh, advice is available everywhere. It's just a, a 21st century phenomenon, which is wonderful. The thing that that's, um, that's missing, and I'll go back to the conversation we had earlier about founders are closer to artists. Imagine um, trying to learn how to paint or, or, or compose music if all you were doing was reading about it in a book, right? Now I've just made the case for some hands-on in an accelerator and incubator. You actually want to get to practice, not just read theory. That is, to me, the, a full you know, education for a founder would be both theory and practice. Again, just like an artist. If you think you can know, learn how to paint by reading, then congratulations, you can you read all you want on the web and, and go do a startup. If you think you might want to take a painting class <laughs> and learn how to do that, then you might want to join an incubator and accelerator. <clears throat> the thing where the analogy breaks down is the other thing for great incubators and accelerators is the network uh, that you will encounter of people, um, core potential um, employees, co-founders, uh, customers, uh, funders, etc. That's invaluable. <clears throat> and I would rate the, the incubator and accelerator not only on practical hands-on experience. Do they give you coaching? Do they you know, allow you to, to try things? But how big and how effective is their network? You retired decades ago. I mean, after an already very successful entrepreneur uh, career, what do you continue you teaching, writing, <coughs> advising startups? Rather than relaxing, what motivates you to keep working so tirelessly rather than play golf or take it easy? Well, I think this is taking it easy. Being retired means, uh, you know, following your passion to wherever you want. Um, you know, while the students see, you know, a class, I see a whole new set of things I learn every every quarter. <laughs> and as, you know, my students, I teach at Stanford now in both the engineering school and the uh, international policy side for national security, um, you know, are teaching me things every day. Um, so if you like to do continual learning rather than stop learning, I mean, some people retire and it's just fine and they work in their garden or, as you say, play golf or or, you know, go sailing. And there's nothing wrong with that. But for me, retirement was doing what I wanted, which was learning, continual learning. Or I just kind of think that the neurons are going to start dying and, and I need to replace them at a never increasing rate. And also, I always have a couple of new ideas of, you know, what if or how come or whatever. And, and the world isn't static. So science advances, technology advances, politics, you know, has become, as you know, and, and, in Europe, uh, Ukraine and Russia and, and the United States with China. I mean, there are all these things going on. And the question is, do you want to be engaged or you want to just retire? Um, as I said, this to me is the, is the best retirement that I could imagine. Are you writing the next book uh, based on your blog posts? I mean, uh, will it be about the history of Silicon Valley? You know, I'm, I think I'm done writing books, though. I, I've said that a couple of times. Um, you know, right now I'm, I teach, um, I, um, I'm an advisor to some parts of the U.S. government on innovation, which government, you know, you think corporate innovation is hard innovation inside of government agencies, whether it's the United States or Turkey or anywhere else in the world is probably, you know, a hundred X harder than corporate innovation, which is a hundred X harder than startup, startup innovation. The things we did for startups and the tools we built look like toys compared to what you need to do. And in government agencies, not because people are dumber or whatever, but there are a lot more processes and, and restrictions. Uh, you know, think about it in, in, a, in a startup, you could do anything. I mean, anything in a company, you could do anything. Your general counsel lawyer tells you, you can't do, um, but, but, or can do, but in a government agency, you can only do the things that you're authorized by law. And so there's a, there's a decreasing freedom of motion or freedom of activity as you go from startup to corporation to government agency and learning how to operate in those environments, I think, are some of the toughest problems. So I tend to be attracted to some of the toughest problems to solve. Not that I think I'm going to solve them, but that because I'm, as I said, curious, I, I think I might want to take a shot at it. Uh, Let me give the, this, this is a thread I want to follow, if you don't mind, for a second. Yeah, sure. Retirement. 
you know, as I, as when I was a young entrepreneur, I was doing things for me, you know, though I had a career in the military, but before I served my country, um, it wasn't until later as I got older that I realized that at some point in your life, um, it could be earlier, it could be later, you want to serve something. And what I mean by serve something, at some point in your life, you might want to make a list. And my list was, do you want to serve God? Do you want to serve country? Uh, do you want to serve community? Do you want to serve family? Um, and you could make your list shorter or longer, and it doesn't matter what God or what, what country or whatever. Um, because when you're young, you tend to want to, most people, though, some people figured this out earlier, want to serve yourself. And so part of retirement was actually being able to figure out how to check those boxes and make sure I have. And and so I can honestly look back and say, I've, I've served my country and, you know, God will only tell whether I've done a good job of that. I've served my community, um, and my family and, and et cetera. And, and so I remind entrepreneurs that, while you're doing all these things that, that you might be having fun with, um, you might want to step back to start NGOs or, or dedicate their life to God and, and mission early on, have kind of figured this out early on. But for, if you're an entrepreneur, it takes a while for, for that to, to kind of percolate that there's a bigger thing in life than just the startup you're working on. So I just want to leave your, your founders with that. If you give you advice, a younger of yourself, what should uh, three of pieces that you will give yourself well you, you know i i i have a bunch of students who when they graduate spend an enormous amount of time angsting and that is worrying over you know is this the right startup or thing to do and it's okay but they really don't have the context that says in their career they have the opportunity to do at least five to ten of them and so try to optimize the, that one first decision. It's good to think about it, but don't. Uh, advice number one is don't over-optimize. You know your first decision. Um, the second is is you should go where your passion goes. Um, if you're not excited about the job you might take or thing you're doing when you wake up in the morning, you need to stop doing it and do something else. You know, if it's just a job, you know, entrepreneurship. Let me be clear. Being a founder, that's not a job. That's a calling. If you're not called to that as literally, I can't imagine doing anything else but this, then you've made the wrong choices. You're doing it. And the reason why it, it has to be a calling is it's the world's most miserable job. It is terrible as a job, but as a calling, it's the world's best adventure. And if you don't understand the difference, then you also have taken a job. Um, but if you can't imagine, you know, like just being immersed in this, then you're going to have a great time. And probably the last thing is don't take yourself too seriously. Um, you know, if your biggest thing is to be on the cover of a blog or a conference or whatever, then you've lost sight of what's important. You know, what's important is making things that people want to grab out of your hands or or people will use or or you're proud to show your mother or and father or that, that you've done or your kids and, and that you could look back and say, you know, I've, I've created something or made a change, whether it was something physical or, or something social or, or something else. As I said, eventually that ties back into the, the mission of, you know, how do you want to live your life? You know, what do you want to serve? And eventually you're going to come around to you need to serve something other than yourself. God, you know, country, you know, community and family. That would be my advice. Steve, this has been, I mean, extremely valuable. And I really appreciate uh, you taking the time to share your knowledge uh, with us today. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. And, and you're reaching a, a whole set of entrepreneurs worldwide and, and just giving them great information to be more successful. So thank you.